All right, hello there. Hello there and welcome to our next lecture video. We are going to talk about cells today. So we're going to talk about cells and the microanatomy of cells, how cells biologically function, what their structures are, and things of that nature. So this is continuing in the lecture series on biological concepts. We're going to venture into the microanatomy here. So what are cells? Well, cells can be summed up in the cell theory, okay? Cells are going to be what all organisms are made of, all right? Everything that is living around us, everything that in biology is alive in nature has the fundamental unit of a cell. And the cell is the fundamental unit of life, right? Our final theory is that all cells come from pre-existing cells, meaning that no cell exists now that did not come from another cell previously or was not budded from or divided, uh, divided from or born from a previous cell back all the way to the most primitive beings or primitive organisms. So here we can see what our ranges of microscopic to macroscopic things might be. Anything that is less than what a human eye is able to see is going to be a microscopic object. So for us, for humans, we are able to see down to roughly one tenth to two tenths of a millimeter, uh, something in in, uh, in diameter or width. Anything underneath that, we are going to not be able to see it with the naked eye. We're going to have to use something to magnify the image. So things that we can see with a magnified image, right? For our standard light microscope, where we can get up to 4,000 times magnification potentially, we can see most bacteria, we can see most archaea, most single cell living organisms we can see. We can see all the plant and animal cells that exist, right? But light microscopes can only take us so far. So once we get down to, let's say, the uh, range of size for viruses down in the nanometer range, we are then going to be too low for a light microscope to see. So we have to bring in electron microscopy. Electron microscopy is going to be able to show us viral structures, individual proteins, extremely small molecules like molecules of water, and individual atoms down to the size of the hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, individual molecules that we see. So we use light microscopes to see larger structures like large single cell organisms like bacteria and multicellular organisms like plant cells and animal cells. For the naked eye, if we have something like a frog egg or a fish egg, very, very small objects, we can see those, all right? But anything less than that, we are going to need a microscope to be able to see. So what kinds of microscopes do we have to analyze cells? Well, we have the standard light microscope that we talked about. That is going to be called the compound light microscope. Our magnification is going to range anywhere from 100 times to 4,000 times. Um, potentially depending on what kind of light microscope you have and how far down you can get. The second kind is called a confocal microscope. Confocal microscope is using contrasting lenses to bend light. Third is a transmission electron or TEM microscope. And this is going to be what we see the smaller images with, especially viruses, individual molecules and atoms. And finally is a scanning electron microscope which is going to show us more of the surfaces of very small objects. So on the left, we have an example of a light microscope, right? We have a light source underneath, we have a stage, we have an objective lens, an occupying lens or an ocular lens, and a nose piece that's going to be able to rotate. Here we can get down, right? And we can see things like individual bacteria. For example, in this image, we have a paramecium and we can see that we have a single celled organism here. This one right here is a confocal microscope. Here we have two select uh, dichotomies or deviations in the lens construction. So we can actually bend and refract light to a greater degree than just a standard light microscope can. For our third one here, we have a standard transmission electron microscope. And for the transmission electron microscope, we're able to see individual structures inside of a cell. So you see all these cellular organelles here. We have 
endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus. We have a, a, a nucleate a nucleated area or an area of genetic material, mitochondria potentially. And finally, for D, we see a scanning electron microscope. And as stated, the scanning electron microscope is able to show us the surfaces of very small objects. So here we can see the surface orientation of this paramecium cell or this bacterial cell and all of the cilia that are projecting from the cellular surface. All right, so for surface area and volume, studying of cells is going to consist of two variations. Right? We're going to have to see how the example is going to show up relative to its surface area, and we have to see what the volume is relative to its surface area. So this is pretty much the width and height operations put together. Okay. So for example, for a surface area, all right, the size of a cube, surface area of a cube is going to be height times width times the number of sides. So for a cube, you're always going to have four sides. So if the height times the width, say we have two centimeters by two centimeters by four sides, two times two times four, then we have 16 centimeters squared as far as the surface area, right? If it's two times two times six, we're gonna have 24 centimeters squared, right? If we have three times three times six, 54 centimeters squared. Volume is going to be the width, length, and height put together, right? So if we have something that's a cube, we know that it's length, a length width, and height are all going to be the same. So all we have to do is multiply those three numbers. If we have one, then we have one. If we have two, then we have eight. If we have three, then we have 27, all right? If we add four, then we would have 64, all right? Quick mental math there. So the ratio of surface area to volume is going to get smaller as something gets larger. So the larger the cell is, the more volume it's going to have, or the larger the area inside of the of the cell is going to be. The smaller a cell is, the more surface area it is going to have in relation to its volume. So for this example, we see that smaller objects have more surface area relative to their volume than larger objects have. In the second picture here, we have an amoeba. We can see that the membrane of the amoeba is going to be highly enfolded. We see a lot of projections and invaginations. This is going to produce a large surface area relative to the cell's volume because we have a cell that's been protruded outwards, increasing the amount of space that it can bind to certain things. And we still have a very small width, a very small height. So these are some features that are common to all cells, right? Doesn't matter if it's a prokaryote, eukaryote, bacteria, all right? It doesn't matter. Cells are going to have DNA, which is their genetic material, this deoxyribonucleic acid. So DNA is going to be nucleic acids where we store the cell's genetic information. The cell is always going to have RNA, right? RNA is going to be what is transcribed and translated to form proteins. This translation is going to happen at a structure known as a ribosome. The ribosomes are going to be where the manufacturing of proteins takes place. Inside of the cell, we have the fluid that is going to hold all the cell components, right? The cytoplasm is going to be the cell components and the fluid combined. The cytosol is the fluid itself. So the cytosol is the fluid portion of the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the fluid plus all of the solid cellular contents that exist except for the nucleus. The plasma membrane is the structure that is forming the border of the cell. So it's separating the cytoplasm from the surrounding environment. Cell membranes are going to have a high surface area because of their phospholipid bilayers and because of their ability to exchange materials with the surroundings. So cells are going to have a high surface area relative to their volume. So when we looked at the scientific study of life, we saw the three domains. Quickly revisit that here, right? We have the domain for bacteria, we have the domain for archaea, and we have the domain for eukaryotic 
itself, right? Our bacterial domain is prokaryotic, does not have a nucleus, does not have membrane-bound organelles. The membrane is going to be made of fatty acids, phospholipids, and a typical size is going to be one to 10 micrometers. For archaea, we're going to have more similarities to bacteria than we have for eukarya. So archaea is going to be a prokaryotic cell, no nucleus, no organelles. Cell membrane is not made up of fatty acids. It is made up of non-fatty acid lipids, right? So it's going to be made up of lipid structures that don't have fatty acid tails. And it's going to be similar in size to a bacteria. The eukarya, which is what we are made of, is going to be a eukaryotic cell. It has a centralized nucleus. It has membrane-bound organelles. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer cell membrane. And the typical size is going to be anywhere from 10 to 100 times larger than a bacterial cell. So here's the anatomy of what we see in a standard bacteria. Right? These bacterial cells are what are known as bacilli or bacillus cells. That means that they are rod shaped and they are standard bacteria, right? Bacterial cells are going to lack a lot of internal components that we see as far as eukaryotic cells are concerned. So we have no membrane bound organelles, meaning that there is no strict structure inside of the uh, bacterial cell. For instance, this bacterial cell, we have a cell membrane we then have a cell wall, and then we have a capsule, which is going to go around the edge of the bacteria. Inside of the cell membrane, we have the cytoplasm. Our cytoplasm is going to consist of three components. We have the nucleic acid in an area known as the nucleosome. And this is not a defined area like a nucleus would be. This is going to be a centralized portion of nucleic acids that is sitting in an area known as the nucleoid. Then we have free floating ribosomes, which are going to take place in protein translation. They're going to be sifting through the cytosol, which is the fluid that is comprised inside of the cell. Finally, since the bacteria are single cell organisms, they are able to move themselves because they are in themselves an entire organism. So they have motility on their own and that motility is provided by flagella or flagellum. Right? And these are the tails that are able to move the bacterial cell around. So our example down here, these are rod-shaped bacillus cells and these are Escherichia coli or E. coli cells. For an animal cell, we're going to be slightly more complicated. Animal cell is going to be much larger. It is not going to have those defined bordering aspects. So it does not have a capsule and it does not have a cell wall. So we do not, uh, do not have that much protection on the outer portion of the cell. We do have membrane-bound organelles. So we have membrane-bound organelles, which are going to each produce a separate function. We have the centralized nucleus, which is going to contain our genetic material. We have a structure that is bordering the nucleus known as the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where we synthesize proteins. And then we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is going to synthesize fats and lipids. It is rough because it has ribosomes bordering it and those studded border ribosomes are giving it a rough texture. The smooth ER is going to be absent of ribosomes, so that is why it is smooth. Then we see something like a centrosome, which is going to hold the microtubules, microfilaments, and the cytoskeletal components of the cell together. We can see our example of cytoskeletal tubule here. That is going to hold onto and scaffold the organelles to move them around to their appropriate positions. Then we have a mitochondria. This is where we do oxidative phosphorylation and metabolism. So using oxygen to create energy through the cell and creating ATP for the cell to use. We have the Golgi apparatus, which is where proteins are packaged into vesicles. We have what is known as a lysosome. This is where we have destruction and lysis of cellular debris and dying cellular components. We have a peroxisome, which is going to act similarly to a lysosome, except where we have the component of hydrogen peroxide inside of these uh, peroxisome structures. So for a plant cell, plant cells and animal cells are relatively similar. We do have a couple of distinct differences though. In a plant cell, we have the presence of a central vacuole. 
which is going to be where we store fluid. So this is one reason why plants are able to survive for long periods without water and nutrients, because they have central vacuoles in their cells that are able to store and house fluid for times of need when they do not have access to it. So similar to how a camel can store water in a tump, plant cells are able to store water in their central vacuole, which gives them a reservoir of liquid to use in times of dryness. We see a lot of the same components here. We have a nucleus, we have endoplasmic reticulums, we've got cytoskeletal components, mitochondria. One other difference is the chloroplast, right? The chloroplast is going to be where we go and utilize sunlight for photosynthesis. So the chloroplast is going to be quite different. It is going to be exclusive to plant cells, and this is where we undergo photosynthetic reactions to produce energy. The last difference is going to be the presence of a cell wall. So with our animal cells, we had a cellular membrane. However, we did not see a cell wall or a capsule like we had in the bacteria. For a plant cell, we do see a cell wall present. So we have a more rigid structure and a more rigid exterior portion of the cell, giving it a little bit more structural integrity. So here's our basic structure of the membrane phospholipid or the phospholipid bilayer structures. So phospholipids are what are comprising the cell membrane that is going around the outside border of the cell. These phospholipids are composed of a head group, which is hydrophilic, meaning that it likes uh, fluid and water, and a tail group composed of the fatty acid tails that are hydrophobic. Right? The hydrophilic group is composed of a phosphate head group with a glycerol attached. The hydrophobic tails are going to be two fatty acid chains. One of them is going to be unsaturated, the other one will be saturated. So this creates a bilayer because the phospholipid tails are going to be hydrophobic, meaning that they're going to avert themselves away from the fluid. They're going to face inward towards each other and are facing a non-aqueous environment. So that is why the head groups are going to be facing out either way because they are facing towards where the liquid is. So as I stated, the process of forming a phospholipid bilayer is going to naturally occur as spontaneous movement away from a liquid source is what the tail groups want to do. So in water, phospholipids are going to form a bilayer because of this fact, because the hydrophilic heads are going to move towards the water and the tails are going to come in to face towards one another to minimize their contact and go farther away from the aqueous solution. Our phospholipid bilayer is good because it is able to be permeable. So we do have selective permeability that we can pass through this lipid bilayer for some substances. Very small molecules, nonpolar molecules and lipids are able to pass through pretty easily. For things like polar molecules, large proteins, ions, things of that nature, we need a transporter to assist. So we need something to assist us by moving those across the cell membrane. So here's the anatomy of a cell membrane. On the left, we see an animal cell. On the right, we see a plant cell. Animal cell is going to be a little bit more uh, susceptible to things passing across it because it does not have that cell wall structure that we see. Cell membrane is composed of what we call a fluid mosaic model because we have a bunch of different molecular types and a bunch of different structures that are composing this wall or this layering. So we see a couple of different things that we notice here. One is the cholesterol molecule. Cholesterol molecules are going to be there to increase fluidity and increase the ability of the cell membrane to adapt to the environment. We also see a couple of combined structures like the phospholipids and phosphoproteins, right? Here, we see sugar molecules attached to proteins, right? So these are what are called glycoproteins. We also see carbohydrates attached to lipids. These are called glycolipids, right? We have a channel protein here. Here are some microfilm, uh, microfilament or cytoskeletal components. The structure of the plant cell is going to be somewhat similar although we have the presence of a cell wall here, meaning that the exterior facing portion of the cell membrane does not have as much of a dichotomy of uh, 
molecular structures as we see in the animal cell. So for example, we have the sugar molecules attached to the proteins here in the animal cell membrane. For the plant cell, we do not see that because the cell wall is covering the area, so we don't have combination of those things together. Here, we still see that we do have our proteins. We do have uh, channels and pro transmembrane proteins, um, and we do have cholesterol molecules in the phospholipid bilayer. But we have this cell wall structure that's covering it and creating a dense structure that's separating the outside environment from the cell. These fibers are what are known as cellulose, which are plant sugars, and those are typically what we see in digestive fiber whenever we eat plant sources. So here is the process of making milk, right? So this is going to be seen in the mammary gland, in the breast, all right? And to make milk, we're going to see a bunch of different cellular processes come into play to create a, a final end product. So we see what each structure inside of the cell is going to do and how it does it. And this gives us a comprehensive view of that. So if we have a normal animal cell, and let's say this is going to be a cell within the mammary gland, the following process will take place. Right? Number one, this genetic material, the DNA, is going to be copied and the milk producing genetic code is going to be made into an mRNA. That mRNA is going to move through the nuclear pores and exit out to where the rough endoplasmic reticulum is. The ribosomes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum are going to gather the information from that transcribed mRNA and are going to be used as the machinery to produce milk proteins. In this case, the milk proteins are the small purple spheres. After those milk proteins have been produced, they will be moved from the rough ER into the smooth ER, and the enzymes inside of the smooth ER are able to manufacture lipids, as stated earlier. So the proteins and the lipids are going to be packaged together at this point. So proteins and lipids are going to move into vesicles and are going to then be sent to the Golgi apparatus. Once they reach the Golgi apparatus, those proteins and lipids are going to be processed and packaged into a vesicle together, and that is going to be sent off for export out of the cell. Once it is sent off for export, it will fuse with the cell membrane, and the products inside of that vesicle will then be allowed to exit through exocytosis to the outside environment through fusion with the cell membrane. So here's an essential portion. Right? For plant and animal cells, we have a nucleus. This is going to be the housing of our genetic code. So the nucleus is containing DNA and is surrounded by two membrane layers, which make up the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is going to have pores in it that are going to allow selective transmission of things across the surface. These large pores are going to allow the proteins to enter and mRNA to leave. In our image here, we have a TEM or transmission electron microscopy image showing the nuclear envelope. In the very center of the nuclear envelope, we have an area of dense genetic material that are known as nucleoli or the nucleolus. The remainder of the area inside of the nucleus has what is called the nucleoplasm, which is the fluid portion of the nucleus. And here we see chromosomes and chromatin floating around inside of this area. Our next structure is going to be a ribosome. Again, ribosomes are where the proteins are processed and made. We have two places that we find ribosomes. One is already mentioned, uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum or RER. Secondly, we do have ribosomes that are free floating around in the cell and the cytosol of the cell. So if we have free floating ribosomes, we are able to produce proteins there as well. So the proteins that are going to be produced, right? If it is going to be produced by the free ribosome, the free ribosome will attach to the mRNA sequence and produce the protein as the mRNA sequence is translated. If we see the uh, mRNA reach a ribosome on the surface of, let's say, the endoplasmic reticulum, then we are going to have proteins produced because the ribosomes are going to be attached to the rough ER's membrane and use specialized organelles in the cell membrane. 
So here's our structures of the rough and smooth ER. All right, our rough ER up at the top. You can see the end of the reticulum is our little network or end foldings extending from the nuclear envelope outwards. Ribosomes are dotting the surface, creating that rough structure, which we uh, associate with the RER. Smooth ER is going to be exterior to the rough endoplasmic particulum. will be on the outside, lacks ribosomes, so therefore we have a smooth surface. And these are interconnecting tubules that are the site for lipid production. Right? So we have protein production at the RER, or rough endoplasmic particulum. We have lipid production at the smooth endoplasmic particulum. When we get to the Golgi apparatus, this is where we see the packaging of proteins into vesicles. So we have a series of flattened sacs that are going to be pretty thin, right? They're going to transport vesicles and are going to be able to deliver and remove materials and waste. Proteins are sorted and processed here, and they're going to make their way to the cell surface or to a lysosome, depending on where that vesicle is destined to go. So those vesicles are either going to the cell surface to be fused and allowed to leave, or they're going to go to a lysosome. Lysosomes are just that, they lyse cells. They are designed to be able to take in and destroy things that they come across. So they contain enzymes that are able to disintegrate and dismantle damaged organelles and other cellular debris. They are then able to release the nutrients that have been salvaged from whatever that cellular debris is and are able to recycle that for the uh, cell to be used. So here for an example, we have a lysosome that is going to ingest a uh, damaged mitochondrial cell. Once we see digestion of that, anything that's viable from the mitochondria that we could reuse or recycle will be sent back into the cell that we can use uh, and reproduce that. For a plant cell, we have that vacuole that we discussed. We have a central vacuole, which is able to house fluid. So in this uh, transmission electron microscopy image, we see spinach leaves, right? So in this case, much of our volume inside of the cell of the spinach leaf, uh, leaf is going to be occupied by this vacuum. Right? And so much of the inner cell portion is going to be occupied by strict fluid. The rest of the cell contents are going to be pushed to the sides of the edge of the cell. So we see a chloroplast lining the edges of the cells here, this green structure. All right? We have the chlorophyll uh, pigment giving it this green hue. But we can see the more space the vacuole consumes, the more we push the organelles of the cell up to the edge. Here's our structure of a peroxisome. So peroxisomes are going to have little granules inside of them, which are known as protein crystals. These give the peroxisome their characteristic appearance in an animal cell, having this protein crystalline structure in the center. So we have mitochondria. Mitochondria is going to be the place for oxidative phosphorylation and metabolism. So our basic cellular respiration occurs here. Each mitochondria has an inner membrane or an inner matrix, which is highly folded, right? And this is going to be where the reactions of the cellular respiration and ox oxidative phosphorylation happen. So we can see the structures. We have an outer and inner membrane. The inner membrane is woven around the mitochondrial matrix. Each individual tunnel or each individual fold is known as a cristae. And those cristae are going to be giving us a large amount of surface area for the production of energy. Here we have the chloroplast, which is going to be in plant cells exclusively. Chloroplasts are going to be the site of photosynthetic reactions. So our photosynthesis or using the light from the sun or a light source to produce energy is going to happen here. Inside of the chloroplast, we have stacks, which are called thylakoid membranes, right? They form what are called a grana. We also have enzymes and light harvesting pigments that are embedded in the membranes. 
of the thylakoid that convert energy in the sunlight to chemical energy. So our thylakoid membranes, which stack on each other and form the granum or grana, are going to be the functional units of the chloroplast. So let's have a comparison. Mitochondria and chloroplast. Mitochondria exist in both plant and animal cells. Chloroplast only exist in plant cells. So what's our difference here? Well, for our first question, do they contain DNA and, and ribosomes? The answer is yes. Both of them have genetic material and ribosome populations. The inner fluid of the, of the uh, mitochondria is known as the matrix. Inner fluid of the chloroplasts are known as the stroma. The membrane structure inside of the mitochondria making up the functional unit is the cristae. The chloroplast structural unit making up the granum is going to be the thylakoids. The function of mitochondria is producing ATP. We need oxygen here, cellular respiration. Chloroplast, it is to produce sugars, which are then used as energy. And those sugars are produced from the chloroplast by the photosynthetic reaction. Locations for mitochondria is pretty much every eukaryotic cell. For chloroplasts, the location is going to be eukaryotic cells that carry out photosynthesis, which would be in plants. So here's some example of specialized cells. Specialized cells are cells that have a specific function, and their structure is going to be indicative of what their function is. So here in our top left, we have a muscle cell from the heart. So heart muscle cells are going to look and behave differently from the tightly branched neurons that form the nervous system. Here we see our neurons up at the top right, our nerve cells. They're going to look quite different than we have for the heart muscle cells. Similarly, we have plants, okay? So for a plant's leaves, they contain chloroplast, whereas the cells that make up the outer skin of an onion do not. So for the outer skin of an onion, we have a white coloring. For a leaf, we have a green color. So here's our cytoskeletal components. We mentioned the centrosomes and centrioles earlier, which are pretty much like the central uh, scaffolding stations for these cytoskeletal components. The proteins of the cytoskeleton are going to be characterized by their size. So we have three sizes of proteins for cytoskeletal components. We have microtubules, which are the largest. These are uh, condensed into what are called tubulin uh, subunits. We have intermediate filaments, which are the second largest. These are going to be condensed into protein subunits. And we have microfilaments, which are the smallest, and they are made of individual actin molecules. So in this particular photo, we see microtubules in purple that are going to surround the DNA, which is centralized here in this blue sphere in the nucleus. So next is our concept of what is called plasmodesmata. And plasmodesmata are going to be the narrow channels which exist between an, uh, plant cells to aid in communication and movement of substance. Right? Plasmodesmata are the narrow channels that allow the exchange of materials between plant cells. This is going to be a perforation in the cell wall is going to allow for adjacent plant cells to communicate with each other. In animal cells, if we are tethered together, it is based off of one of three things. We either form a tight junction, which is going to fuse cells together. This is going to anchor junctions. Uh, we also have an adhering junction, which is known as an anchoring junction. This is going to be put together and held into place um, by interlocking interdigitations or finger processes. We also have what are called gap junctions, which are pretty much channel proteins that are going to allow for the transport of substance between two cells in an animal uh, situation. So for communication between cells in the plants, we have the plasma desmata. And the plant cells, we have these channels are going to allow for substances to move between the plant cells. For animal cells, we have three variations of cellular attachment. We have tight junctions, which are going to fuse and seal the spaces between the cells. Right? These are located in places such as the cells of the inner lining of the stomach or small intestine. 
We have anchoring or adhering junctions, which are going to have adjacent animal cell membranes in one spot. We're connecting the cells to an extracellular matrix. And finally, gap junctions, which are more like pores or channels that are going to be between adjacent animal cells, allowing for substances to cross. All right, examples of this are the muscle cells in the heart and the digestive tract. So here's a kind of little comparison chart for you. Prokaryotic, we do not have a nucleus. We do not have membrane-bound organelles. And our typical size is about 1 to 10 micrometers. Whereas with a eukaryotic cell, we do have a nucleus. We do have membrane-bound organelles. And our typical size is anywhere from 10 to 100 micrometers. All right, so here's our differences with the bacterial cell and the eukaryotic cell. Both of them are going to have DNA and RNA. Both of them are going to have ribosomes. Both have a cytoplasm and both have cell membranes. The rest of the things are going to be different. And all of the membrane bound organelles that exist in the eukaryotic cell are going to be something that the bacterial cell does not have. So for the organisms, the number of cells in an organism for a prokaryote is usually one. For a eukaryote, it is usually many right? Thousands, millions, billions. The domain for a prokaryotic cell is either going to be in the bacteria or the archaea, and the eukaryotic cell is going to be in the eukarya. All right, so here's our summary of a couple of our membrane-bound organelles in a cell structure, all right? So we see a ribosome. Ribosome is going to be present in eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells, plant cells, animal cells, pretty much all types of cells. We have two globular subunits that compose of RNA and protein that exist here. And we have the location of protein synthesis in the cell. Our cytoskeleton, our cytoskeletal components, we have the microtubules, uh, microfilaments and intermediate filaments. These are going to be uh, subunits put together of filaments and tubules that are going to allow for scaffolding of organelles, movement of organelles within the cell, maintenance of the structure and integrity of the cell, and also the structure and integrity of extracellular appendages like flagella or cilia. These are also present in all cell types. All right, that's a comparison between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Thank you all for listening. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Also the Patreon, patreon.com slash twistedscience. Thank you all for listening. I will see you at our next video. Peace out.